methods. The point of this video, or what we're gonna cover in this video, is basically how we can use Excel and Excel Solver to solve a linear programming problem. In particular, what we're gonna be working with and what you see on the left side of the video right now is the linear programming model of the Bigger Lego Workshop example. And what we're going to do is we're basically going to talk about how we can formulate this problem in an Excel spreadsheet and then ultimately use Excel Solver to determine the optimal values of the decision variables. Now there's a number of different software packages available to solve linear programming problems. We're obviously going to focus on how to use Excel to solve this particular problem. So what you see now, what you see on the right side of your screen is essentially the framework of a spreadsheet that is going to help us translate the linear program to Excel. And basically what we have here is that each decision variable in this linear program is represented as a column in Excel. So in particular, you see that column B corresponds to decision variable X1, or equivalently the number of T's that we're going to make in the workshop. X2 is represented in the C column, and then X3 is represented in the D column. And then what we're going to kind of specify is where will the actual decision variables take place in the spreadsheet. So if we look down at uh, row 13, we're going to highlight three cells. These are going to essentially be our decision variable cells. We're going to be interested in having Excel Solver change the values in these cells to optimize our objective. And then what we're going to have in, in the spreadsheet as well, so each, each decision variable is represented in a column. We're going to have each object, the objective function and then each constraint represented as a row. So we can look at row four. We've labeled it profit. This is going to be our objective function. And then we have our three constraints, our small bricks constraint, our big bricks constraint, and our T upper bound or T limit constraint. And so what we'll do, kind of just setting up this spreadsheet, is that for each row and each decision variables, the entry of that cell will correspond to its leading, the coefi leading coefficient of that variable in the appropriate function from our linear program. So for profit, the leading coefficient or the objective function coefficient of x1 is 3. So we're going to have a 3 in cell B4, the leading coefficient for or the objective function coefficient of x2 is 2 in the objective function and is 4 for x3. So what this gives us is basically we know that I make $3 each, each time I increment x1, $2 each time I increment x2, and then $4 each time I increment x3 by one. So what, in order to get our objective function, we need to basically multiply the entry in B4 by our decision variables. And we said before, our decision variables were going to be in cells B13, C13, and D13. So we want to express our objective function in terms of where things are laid out in our spreadsheet. So we can start writing our objective function. We can first focus on the 3x1 term, 3x1. We're going to take B4 where 3 appears, and we're going to multiply that by where X1 appears in our spreadsheet, so B13. And then we also have 2 times X2, so basically C4 times C13 plus D4 times D13. So again, I mean, all this is doing, if we look at kind of the highlighted cells and the cells we've incorporated, we're taking the three and multiplying it by x1. That's our first term, b4 times b13. Then we're looking at, we're trying to look at 2x2, so c4 times c13, etc. So the one thing about kind of calculating the objective function in this way is that it takes a lot of clicking. 
basically, and it's not very scalable. I mean, if when you're getting into more than a couple decision variables, it can become a little bit of a pain. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a function now in Excel that will essentially do this in a much quicker and more efficient manner. So what we're going to use is we're going to use the function called sum product. And for our purposes, sum product, we're going to have two entries. And basically those entries are going to be a set of cells. So our first entry is going to be B4 through D4. And the second entry is going to be a set of cells of equal dimension to the first set of cells we selected. So we're going to select B13 through D13. So both of these sets of cells are one by three. One column, or sorry, one row by three columns. And what the sum product does, it basically says, I'm going to sum up the products of each of the entries that are in the same spot in the selected cells. So what that means is basically, B4 was the first entry in the blue selection, B13 is the first entry in the green selection. So I'm going to multiply B4 times B13 and add that to the two other products, and in particular the products of the second cells in the entry, so C4 and C13, and the products of the product of the third entries in these, so D4 and D13. So exactly what we had written out before. Now one other thing, kind of looking at this that we're going to quickly change is that we're going to put in a dollar sign in front of the two 13s. And what that is going to allow us to do is that's going to allow us to copy and paste this function down without changing where the decision variables are. We know the decision variables are always going to be in B13 through D13, but as we see when we're trying to kind of model the functions associated with the number of small bricks and big bricks that are used, um, we're going to want to keep the decision, obviously the decision variables are going to be in the same entries, but the parameters we're going to multiply will be in different rows. So kind of going into those examples, we can now set up our constraints and the, the entries in each column and each row are going to be very similar to how we got the objective, the entries in the objective function row. We're basically going to figure out what's the leading coefficient of each of the decision variables in that particular constraint. So if we look at the small bricks constraint, we have 2x1 plus x2 plus x3. So our parameters for our small bricks constraints will be 2, 1, and 1. So now if I use and copy and paste this sum product formula down to the small bricks constraint, what we're doing is we're saying our small brick utilization is b7 times b13 plus C7 times C13 plus D7 times C D13. So in other words, kind of going back to what the, those cell entries represent in Excel, we're basically multiplying 2x1 plus x2 plus x3 to get our total resource utilization of small bricks. So and also look at big bricks. We have a 1, a 1, and a 2 as the leading coefficients for the big bricks constraint. So and again, if we do copy the sum product down, that's why the, the dollar signs become so important. The, the 13 will not change if we have the dollar sign in front of it. We end up basically having a Excel representation of x1 plus x2 plus 2x3. For the t-limits, we only have x1 in our t-limit, so we have just, just need to en enter the 1 entry. The last thing in kind of terms of setting up the spreadsheet itself is these three entries in the respective rows gives us how much of the resource we are using based on our decision variables. And then we also have the right-hand sides of the constraints, so how much of the resource we actually have on hand. So we have 200 small bricks in this example, 200 big bricks, and then 40 as a T upper bound. So we're just taking the right-hand sides of these constraints. And at this stage, we've expressed with respect to where our decision variables are, the objective function, as well as kind of the left-hand sides of each of our constraints from the linear program. So at this stage, we're ready to bring up Excel Solver and to implement and ultimately solve this model. So when we bring up, we go to Tools, bring up Solver, we see this box basically. And the first entry is the objective function entry. So what we want to put into this box is where on our spreadsheet 
is our objective. So it's in E4. So we're going to have an objective of E4. And then we want to maximize. We're in a maximization setting, so we'll have a max. And then the next entry, or so we'll, uh, the next entry will be where our decision variables occur. So if you look at, if you kind of read the text, it says by changing variable cells. So basically that tells Excel Solver which cells am I allowed to change their values in terms of, ma in order to maximize our objective. So we're going to highlight our three um, production amount cells, and then we're ready to start adding the constraints. And when we go in to add the constraints, we have a couple options. We have an option to add each constraint one by one. So we can add a constraint that says the total amount of small bricks is less than or equal to the right-hand side of small bricks. So total amount of small bricks used in our decisions is less than or equal to 200. So if we click OK, we'll see that that entry, that, um, that constraint now appears in our constraint box. So this, this final box is subject to constraints. I'm going to delete this because there's a little bit of a quicker way to add a set of constraints that all have the same relationship. So what we'll do is we can actually add in all three constraints at once. So the cell references that we'll pull up are E7 through E9. And since they're all less than or equal to constraints, we can then basically put in two the right-hand sides of these constraints. And similar to kind of the sum product function, Excel basically reads this set of constraints as the first entry in the selected set of cells needs to be less on the left hand side needs to be less than or equal to the first entry in the selected set of cells on the right hand sides. So if we hit OK, all three of these constraints will be added simultaneously. Now obviously if you have a mixture of less than or equal to constraints and greater than or equal to constraints and equality constraints, that trick will not necessarily work because you need all the constraints going the same direction if you're going to add a set of them at the same time. Um, one thing we want to make sure in as we're getting ready for to solve this problem, we're going to keep the check mark make unconstrained variables non-negative. So we actually don't need to add in one by one the non-negative constraints. This is an automatic kind of thing as long as we keep the check mark, the box checked. Uh, when we're looking at selecting a solving method, we want to make sure that we bring up the simplex LP and then we can click solve. And what we're going to see happen is that the decision, the variable cells where decision variables are included, will basically change. So we're, we're just going to basically keep the solver solution. So we're going to click OK. And then we can kind of see, we see that the decision variables change, as well as the objective function and the left hand sides of the constraint. So what this says is that the optimal profit. Optimal objective function is $440, and we get that by making 40 T's and 80 cakes. So equivalently, we set, set X1 equal to 40 and X3 equal to 80. It turns out in this particular example, we don't make any cakes, so X2 is equal to 2. And we can also see kind of our reader resource utilization levels as well. So by making 40 X setting X1 equal to 40 and X3 equal to 80, we end, only end up using 160 small bricks. The kind of binding constraints is the number of big, big bricks and our T limit. Um, so kind of concludes, and then, I mean, one thing now we can do is we can translate, well, we know X1 is equal to 40, X3 is equal to 80. We can translate that back to the optimal solution of our linear program and then read basically the variable definitions to understand the number of T's and cakes and I's we're going to make. So that concludes this video. I mean, the key takeaway is kind of how do we translate a linear program to Excel and then ultimately use Excel Solver to solve that.